Welcome, to Declassifying the Paranormal. Here we reveal the secrets that sinister organizations attempt to conceal from the world, objects and entities that could shake the very foundations of what we think is, and is not, possible. Today we have secured documents belonging to the SCP Foundation, and will reveal to you the nature of SCP-6007. Item Number, SCP-6007 Object Class, Keta Special Containment Procedures Since the behavior induced by SCP-6007 is simply an exaggeration of a non-anomalous human disposition, direct containment of SCP-6007 and its effects is considered unnecessary. However, unsanctioned civilian research that may lead to the discovery of SCP-6007 is to be defunded. A perimeter has been established surrounding SCP-6007-8 to deny civilian entry under the cover story of a logging operation. Description SCP-6007 is a type of electrical signal that is detected at all points of the globe. SCP-6007 has a tendency to reflect off flat surfaces. This leads SCP-6007's intensity to be significantly higher indoors as opposed to outdoors, since any waves that do penetrate walls tend to linger and accumulate over time. SCP-6007 induces a neurochemical reaction in the human brain that exaggerates an individual's desire to travel. The chemical production caused by SCP-6007 is extremely slow and will only result in a noticeable change in behavior over the course of years of exposure to high-intensity SCP-6007 waves. Discovery SCP-6007 was discovered by Dr. Matthew Liswill during a survey of unexplained electrical waves detected by Foundation sites. For the full report see a survey of foreign interference signals and threat assessment by Liswill et al. After completing a biological investigation of SCP-6007, Dr. Liswell submitted the following funding request. SCP-6007 Investigation Proposal Preface Dr. Matthew Liswell Budget Requested, $25,000 Purpose, Purchase of Plane Flights and lodging for six researchers for three different trips each to a destination of their choosing. I will preface this request by saying I know how this looks, but I promise this isn't some ploy for paid vacation. After concluding my research into the psychological effects of SCP-6007, we still lack a proper containment mechanism. While it is innocuous at the moment, these are still foreign electrical signals. Who knows if they will stay innocuous? We know the localized and immediate effects of SCP-6007, but that's it. I would like to try a different form of study. Instead of laboratory samples, investigating long-term case studies. I want to let a group of subjects give in to the travel bug and see where it takes them. I've attached a list of researchers who I know have been somewhat affected by SCP-6007. I know we would normally send out D-class for this, but I don't trust that they would know what to look out for. Besides, us white coats could use a break from these concrete cages too. SCP-6007 Study Travel Log The project was approved, and four researchers were selected to participate, including Dr. Liswell. Selected researchers were forbidden from communicating with each other about their travel plans and experiences to isolate each case. Below is a brief log of the locations and activities performed by the researchers as a part of this project. Trip Number Locations Activities 1. Tokyo, Japan, New York City, USA, London, UK, Paris, France Museum viewing, attending performances, other low-intensity observational activities. 2. Galapagos Islands, Ecuador, Reykjavik, Iceland, San Jose, Costa Rica, Queenstown, New Zealand. Wildlife observation, day hikes, other medium-intensity outdoor activities. 3. Hanoi, Vietnam, Himalayan Mountains, Nepal, 
Gaborone, Botswana, Anchorage, USA. Backpacking, walking safari, dog sledding. 4. Cusco, Peru, Queer Bar, Brazil, 2x, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. All plan to go on extended backpacking trips into the Amazon forest. The study halted after day four of the final excursion, when it was apparent that all subjects were headed for the same destination. SCP-6007-A SCP-6007-A is a stretch of approximately 100 square kilometers land in the northwest region of the Amazon rainforest. Experiments indicate that, should an individual be allowed to indulge the desire to travel imposed by SCP-6007, they will eventually attempt to travel to SCP-6007-A as part of a mission of self-discovery. Four vine-like spires are placed throughout SCP-6007-A. They are approximately 30 meters tall, and 2 meters in diameter. SCP-6007 amplitude measurements indicate that the waves originate from these spires. The boundary of SCP-6007-A is marked by a sudden reduction in humidity. There is also a decrease in vegetation closer to the center of SCP-6007-A despite the scarcity of native flora. Local fauna still frequently venture into SCP-6007-A. In addition to the fauna there appear to be living anomalous entities within SCP-6007-A, henceforth designated SCP-6007-B. SCP-6007-B are living entities that appear to be humanoid in shape, but consist entirely of roots. These roots extend underground and indeterminate distance. The arms of SCP-6007-B instances do not terminate in a hand-like appendage, but rather form a simple pincer. The roots that make up SCP-6007-B instance heads are shaped to loosely approximate a face, with sockets for eyes, and an indent that resembles an permanently open mouth. However, there is no evidence that these cavities have sensory capabilities. Exploration To better understand SCP-6007 and SCP-6007-A, a small exploration was deployed to take measurements of one of the spire structures. This exploration was deployed on foot as to avoid disrupting SCP-6007-A's natural state. Researcher Matthew Liswell and junior researcher Stephanie Liu were chosen to perform this operation due to their familiarity with SCP-6007 and outdoorsmanship. Exploration Footage 1 The following footage was recorded when Liu and Liswell arrived at the border to SCP-6007, which occurred at 8.16 local time. Begin Log Lou and Liz will walk quietly side by side as they approach the perimeter of SCP-6007. Hey, Stephanie, can we stop a moment? Lou stops. Liz will jogs ahead slightly and begins brushing the dirt and detritus aside on the ground. Okay, come on over. Lou steps up and films over Liz will's shoulder. You see that there? That crack in the ground? Just a bit. Liswell digs around on the ground before holding up two handfuls of soil. This dirt is from our side of the crack, and this is from the other side. See how much drier it is? I think we're about to depart from normalcy. I'll ping our location for command. Good, good. Liswell looks back at the ground while Lou signals their position to command. You know. You could be a little more excited about it. Huh. I mean, you don't get off site all too much, right? Not for work, no, but at the end of the day, field work is just field work. Liz will stands up and dusts himself off. You go on many hikes? I'm more of a skier myself. Ah, I see. I used to go on backpacking trips with my roommates. Haven't had much time recently though. MHMM. Anyways, I've been eager for this exploration. Lou begins walking forward. 
Liz will follows alongside her. In fact, I heard that this part of the Amazon has been a popular destination from my more experienced backpacking buddies. Do you know anyone who's actually been down this way? No one who's actually made the trip. Just people who made the plans. And honestly, maybe they did go, and just never came back. I don't appreciate half-assed attempts to scare me on my first outing. Oh sorry, I wasn't, I didn't even know this was your first mission. Well, now you do. Anyways, I'm not trying to scare you. Just have some conversation to keep the atmosphere loose, you know. Besides these are all friends of friends, so I don't have any confirmation they've been down here, not to mention if they made it back. Hiking stories tend to get passed around and exag. Lou stops suddenly, and holds up a hand. Liz will halts as well. Lou points in front of them, slightly to the left. After a moment, bushes rustle from that direction, and a mass of roots retreats further into the rainforest. Did it any of your friends mention sentient plants? You're sure that was sentient? It was spying on us. Most plants don't eavesdrop. Most plants don't have faces. I just don't want to jump to conclusions. But, yes it did have a face. Command did not mention there would be dryads in our briefing. Should we turn around? Nah, we're fine. One thing you'll learn with field work, is that nothing goes according to the briefing. And, because of that, if we turn around each time we see something strange, we'll never make it more than a few steps. I see. In that case, we should get going. Lead the way. End log. Exploration footage 2. The following was recorded after nightfall on the first day at 1825 local time. GPS signals indicate that Lou and Liz will have traveled approximately 11 kilometers from the border of SCP-6007-A. Begin log. And it's not like it worked. My brother still smokes no matter how many times. Yeah, that sounds rough. It is, but I get through it. Anyways, um Matt, it getting dark already. Only barely. We still have time. We should still start looking for somewhere to set up camp. You know, there are those tree groves we passed. They could act as a hut of sorts. I would be amenable to that. I think I see one up ahead. Liswell and Lou walk ahead, diverging from GPS directions. They approach a tightly spaced collection of trees, forming a circle. The trees have thin trunks, and their branches only protrude into the circle. Liswell and Lou are able to maneuver between the trunks, but only after removing their packs to be passed through separately. Inside the circle, the branches from the trees have grown together overhead to form a mesh that blocks out most of the light from overhead. Wow. You know, Steph, I always dreamed about sleeping under a sky of leaves. Lou films the ground of the grove. A cocoon of roots have formed in the center of the grove. Lou kneels down, bringing the camera closer to her end of the structure. The camera cannot properly adjust to the low lighting to make out features beyond the roots. Matt, we should go. Why? Lou points to the cocoon. Liswell pulls out a flashlight and shines it where Lou is kneeling. The camera can now make out a human face underneath the roots. Lack of decay and coloration indicate this person remained alive. No don't. Lou stands up and covers Liswell's flashlight with her hand. Oh. I was not expecting that. We should find somewhere else to camp. Or maybe we could wake them and... Matt, I, I really don't think it's a good idea. All right, fine. Lou and Liz will exit the grove. That's really too bad. It's such a unique arrangement. I know we see anomalies a lot, 
but it's nice to appreciate when nature does something strange on its own. You know? I guess. Reminds me of this time, I was out in the Appalachians. End log. It is estimated that Lou and Liz will pass at least six similar grows prior in the exploration. Lou and Liz will set up camp at 2043 local time, having traveled 15 kilometers. This is less than half of the distance prescribed in the exploration timeline to ensure a return within three days. Interview log During travel on the second day, at 11.33 local time, Lou and Liz will encountered a pair of civilian hikers. Facial recognition identified them as Luis Garba and Enrique Fernandez, both reported as missing individuals three months prior. Despite initial objections from Lou, Liswell conducted an interview with these civilians under the guise of reporting on tourism in the Amazon rainforest. Liswell stands next to Garba and Fernandez, who are both wearing tank tops and tie-dye bandanas. This is Matthew Liswell here with Luis Garber and Enrique Fernandez, here to talk about their experience traversing the Amazon. Luis gives a small wave to the camera and Enrique nods. First, what inspired you to take your travels to the Amazon? Well, Enrique and I had been on a bit of a travel spree. Take some time off work, see the world and all that. And after seeing Europe and Asia, we decided that backpacking through Brazil would be a great way to see South America. You two do much backpacking? Yeah, we do a little hiking here and there. Sleeping out in nature is just good for the soul, you know. Indeed. You must have spent quite a few nights out here. Oh, I think we've only been out for less than a week. I think we're on day. Four? The time doesn't matter. We'll walk until we reach the end. It's one of those journey over destination vibes. Of course, of course. You know... My man, sometimes I think the forest wants us here. Like, it gives us places to sleep, water to drink, and food to eat. This is where we belong, right baby girl? Fernandez plants a kiss on Garba's cheek. She giggles. Food? Honestly, I don't think I've seen any fruits here. Nah ma'am. I ain't talking about nutrients from the ground. Garba leans in closer to Liswell. I wasn't awake for this, but he somehow found smoked meat. I did not find that. The forest presented it to me. As an offering, with outstretched hands. Like a person? Like a person made of trees. Interesting. It's looking out for us man. The world looks out for us. That's really what you learn when you explore. You always learn something on a hike. Nah, I'm not just talking about hiking. Just traveling. Seeing the world. Expanding your horizons. You know, the part of the brain that inspires people to travel is the same part of the brain that inspires self-growth and improvement. Where did you hear that? Some health blog. And out here, we're not just learning about us, but our place in the world. On this big ball. How small we are, how big everything else is. Liz will nod silently. Um, we should probably get going. Right, right. Well, it's been great talking to you both. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. End log. Exploration Footage 3 On Day 3, Liswell and Lou began cutting back substantially on ration consumption, in an attempt to preserve food for the return journey. Command discussed airdropping additional supplies, however the decision was made to wait until Liswell and Lou had arrived at the target to prevent any unnecessary disruptions to SCP-6007-A's ecosystem. Begin Log Lou is lagging significantly behind Liswell, 
whose voice is muffled since he is speaking away from Lou's microphone. Hey, Matt. Can we just slow down a bit? Liz will stops and turns around. I thought we needed to go faster since, you know, we're running out of food. We don't need to be fast, we need to be efficient. I'd take that as getting more distance per meal. That's easy to say when you're not carrying an extra ten pounds. Lou jiggles the camera. Touché. I mean, we should probably be looking for food anyways. I'm not sure we should trust anything we find out here. If it's that or starve. We won't starve. We have extra rations. We just need to be conservative. I'll keep my eyes out anyways. Sure. Whatever. Actually, do you smell that? Smell what? It's smoky. Forest fire. I think it's coming from this way. Liz will runs left, deviating from the prescribed path. Lou follows him slowly, occasionally losing sight of Liz will between the trees. Matt, slow down. Liz will stops. Lou catches up to Liz will, who points at an abnormally formed tree in front of him. A large hole has formed in the trunk, which emits a thin stream of smoke. The branches of the tree are all angled upward. Almost no light is transmitted through the leaves. Amazing. Should we put it out? Possibly. Let's take a closer look first. Liswell and Lou approach the tree, angling the camera to see inside the hole. The floor of the trunk consists of a leaf-like surface, on top of which is a small pile of twigs which acts as kindling for a fire. A stick is wedged within the interior walls of the tree. A piece of meat is skewered on this stick. It's like a sunlight funnel. That's being used for cooking? Liswell removes the skewer and examines the meat. I would say it's effective. A crackling sound can be heard off camera. Lou and Liz will turn to see an SCP-6007-B entity approaching the tree carrying a stack of twigs. Hello? The entity stops. Liz will points to the meat, and then to the entity. Is this yours? The SCP-6007-B entity holds out an appendage. It's for us. Whispers, we need to run. The entity extends its appendage again. Liswell begins inspecting the meat. We're fine. We've heard about this before. I don't care. We should go. We should at least eat first. What? You need to eat, right? I don't want to carry this for ten minutes just to eat it later. We should just have it here. I'm not eating that. We don't know if it's poisoned or what kind of animal it comes from or... We haven't had any approach of anomalous animals. Even then, will you know what animal we have seen around here? Humans. I don't think this is human meat. You have experience with that? No, but I think human meat resembles pork more. So you're okay with eating that? I'm checking it over first, but after that yeah. But... Liswell takes a bite of the meat. Um, smoky. Lou swats the skewer from Liswell's hand. Steph, we could have replaced rations with that. I said I'm not eating that. Then I could have eaten it and you could have my rations. And I'm not letting my partner get any more compromised than you already are. Liswell turns back to the SCP-6007-B entity. I'm so sorry for her. You're apologizing to it. You threw its food on the ground. But, oh fuck it. I'm going back before we're surrounded. Lou turns toward the GPS-directed path. After a few minutes, Liswell follows after her, and eventually overtakes her. 
End log. Exploration footage 4. At 1422 on the third day of exploration, Liswell and Lou had their closest encounter with an SCP-6007-B entity. Begin log. Liswell walks ahead of Lou. He deviates from the GPS directions, wandering into the foliage to closer observe unidentified flora. Lou moves slower than Liswell under the weight of the camera and broadcasting equipment, and remains consistent with the GPS directions. Matt, can you stay on the path? I'm going to lose you at this rate. Stop worrying. It's not like we're in a rush. We're two days behind schedule. We're making progress. Besides, we rarely get to be outside for this long an hour. Stop. Liswell stops moving. Lou continues forward, catching up with Liswell. Come again? Just stop. I am not listening to another one of your fucking nature lectures. Or your self-improvement lectures. Or any of your lectures. Do you know how pretentious you sound? How obnoxious and grandiose. You know you're not just talking to me, right? All of command will hear this. And over these days you have filled so much of the airwaves with garbage. Can we not just walk in silence? Just for once? Liz will gazes at the ground. Ah. I see. Apologies. Accepted. Now let's keep moving. Lou steps on a bush whose leaves remain low to the forest floor. However, they obscure the fact that there is no solid ground underneath them. The bush's branches give way. Lou slides approximately three meters, landing in a waist-high pool. Ah, fuck. Steph, are you hurt? Lou, I feel sticky, but I'm fine. Liswell removes the bush branches from the opening to the hole, more light to enter the hole. The camera can now see that the pool Lou stands in is filled with an opaque liquid. The walls of the hole are smooth and sloped at approximately 45 degrees. Lou attempts to clamber out of the hole by digging her hands into the loose dirt in the walls. However, she cannot maintain a proper grip due to a mucus coating over the hole's surfaces. During this time, Liswell examines the bush leaves. Is it just you, or does something smell sweet? I don't know. I guess so. It's just, there's a very sweet smell here but this bush has no fruit. Can you just get me out? I will, I will. Just give me a moment. We came out here to learn about the anomaly, this could very well be a part of it. I don't want it to pull you out just to jump back in the hole because we missed something. Fine. So you want to know about the sweetness? Yes. I think the liquid is what's sweet, but there's an unevenness around my feet that might be leaching the smell into it. Maybe. Is the unevenness soft? Parts feel soft but others feel like loose rocks. Can you pick one of them up for me? I think the sweetness is coming from that fluid, but I have a bonus theory. You'll need to hold the camera and comms equipment. Lou passes the camera and her backpack up to Liswell, who starts filming the pool. Lou dives under the liquid. See, this feels like a trap set up by the dryads but I don't think they're able to produce this membrane, or this liquid. They've demonstrated very rudimentary hunter-gatherer skills. So instead... Lou resurfaces. She is visibly uncomfortable. Parts of it are hairy. Let's see it then. Lou lifts her hand from the water. She holds the waterlogged and partially disintegrated body of a spider monkey. The corpse's legs slough off into the water. Holy fuck. That is exquisite. Lou drops the monkey. They must have come to the bush seeking some sort of fruit or berries. Help me. And then when they fall in, the membrane on the walls prevents them from climbing out. 
This pool is full of dead monkeys. Yes, that's the point. And I can't get out. Liz will zooms in on the bush branches. He can barely be heard over Lou's screams. That's how this thing stays so healthy despite being so low to the forest floor. It's seeping nutrients from the mammals digesting in the pool. Of course, it's a very slow process, but effective. There is a snapping sound behind Liswell. He turns around to film two SCP-6007-B entities traveling toward the hole. Sobbing, Matt. Please. Good afternoon. The entities turn to face Liswell before continuing to the hole. They both peer inside. Weakly, they're looking at me. Hang tight Steph, they've never gotten this close before. Both SCP-6007-B entities descend into the hole. The base of the dryads cuts through the mucous membrane coating the hole's walls. The membrane reforms behind the entities. One entity reaches into the pool and extracts a monkey corpse. The other also retrieves a corpse, but offers its other appendage to Lou. Lou looks at the entity, and then up at Liswell. Liswell gives a thumbs up. Lou grabs the SCP-6007-B entity's roots, who then ascends from the hole, pulling Lou with it. Fascinating. Lou is left lying down next to the hole. It is apparent that the liquid from the pool has a syrupy texture. The SCP-6007-B entities return the way they came. So that's how they get their meat. They just take the leftovers of what nature has already created. They don't need to develop tools or interfere on their own. There's enough to survive on. Liz will zooms in on Lou. It is only now that the bags under her eyes and the paleness of her skin become apparent, presumably caused by multiple nights or poor sleep and days of malnourishment. They even extract Steph, because if she stayed in the hole it would have caused a disturbance. But now that unexpected prey is no longer present, everything can return to how it was. The plant will keep catching animals, and the dryads will have meat. Isn't that amazing, Steph? Lou stands, and motions for Liswell to return her backpack and camera. Oh, right. Sorry, let my inner David Attenborough take over. Liswell returns Lou's belongings, and they resume travel. Liswell continues to talk about nature documentaries until the two turn in for the night. End log. Exploration footage 5. At 11.02 on the fourth day, Liswell and Lou arrived at the center of SCP-6007-A. Begin log. The foliage has thinned significantly compared to the boundary of SCP-6007-A. There are fewer trees, and instead more bushes. Additionally, the topsoil is drier. And I asked him, is there really a reason we can't have more windows in the building? And of course he mentioned something about breaches and someone seen inside but, we're located out in the middle of the woods. No civilian is just going to walk over there. Lou does not respond. Really, they got us locked up as tightly as the anomalies. It's why I love field missions. Let's you get out. Let's you escape. Some patches of bright pink ground can be seen where there is no topsoil. A clearing is seen up ahead. Reminds me of what that hippie guy said, remember him. How travel is really the soul wanting to improve? I'm going to use that one when we get back home, believe me. Just because, like, it's so true. Especially because we like, as a species need to do better. Like the dryads. They have this whole little section of forest and they thrive in it and maintain it and it's also beautifully mutual. Liswell and Lou arrive at the clearing. There is no topsoil in the clearing, revealing the ground to be entirely pink and spongy. Additionally, within the clearing is the spire, indicating this is Lou and Liswell's final destination. The spire does not sprout from soil similar to previous flora observed but rather protrudes directly from the spongy ground, 
and appears to take on a lime green color. Ah, it seems we've arrived. I haven't been this excited to collect samples in a long time. Liz will walks forward, but Lou does not follow. Oh, come on. We're almost there. Liz will grabs Lou by the arm and guides her to the spire. Lou's skin is pale, and her arm hangs limply. I'm just so deeply curious. What makes this place tick? Like, are the dryads actually related to these spires or do they just coexist like everything else here? If you want to know my take, I think they're separate. I think their origins are almost entirely disjoined from this place. You know why? Lou does not respond. Because I think they came from us. Why would they have eye sockets but no eyes? Why would they have mouths if they cannot speak? It's a facsimile of a face, because it's vestigial. It hasn't been worked out of the evolutionary line yet. But really they are us. Why would they entice us with food and shelter if it wasn't an invitation to join them? To ascend to this more balanced existence? Liswell and Lou arrive at the spire. Liswell approaches it. SCP-6007-B entities can be seen gathered at the edge of the clearing. And maybe, just maybe, this will teach us how to change. It's the rare situation where you learn something from the journey as well as the destination, eh? Lou does not respond. Hey, you want the moment of glory? Give the first report? Here, give me the recording equipment. You can touch it and tell us the texture. Liswell takes the camera and recording equipment from Lou. She is shivering. Go on. You can touch it. Lou reaches out, her arm trembling, and touches the spire. The ground shakes. Liswell drops the camera. End log. At 11.13, local time, SCP-6007-A folded down its center both halves lifting from the ground and rotating until they became flush with one another. The motion took 0.35 seconds to complete. This geological event resulted in a small earthquake, measuring 3 on the Richter scale. SCP-6007-A remained in this state for three minutes before unfolding. Pictures captured by drones patrolling SCP-6007-A at the time noted three key abnormalities. The area underneath SCP-6007-A is an empty hemisphere. The only entity within the hemisphere is a tangle of roots and vines, which connects to the center of SCP-6007-A. The texture and color of this mass resembles that of SCP-6007-B entities. While in its folded state, SCP-6007-A's shape resembled that of the Dionemu Shippola, otherwise known as the Venus Flytrap. Thank you for tuning in, we hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. If you did please subscribe, like and share it around. If you have any particular case files you like us to cover in future broadcasts leave a comment below and we'll get around to it shortly. Tune in again tomorrow for more revelations.